Welcome to uh, Creative Mornings. So uh, it's nice to see you all here today. Uh, thank you for waking up so early to be to be here. I know it's always a bit of a challenge to be at 9 a.m. in Bangkok and to to drive through the city. So I really appreciate all your efforts. So my name is uh, Vincent Ribier. I manage the Institute for Knowledge and Innovation here at Bangkok University, and I am the host of uh, Creative Mornings Bangkok. So. For those of you who are new, Creative Mornings is uh, an event which was started uh, in 2008 in the US. Uh, the concept is to bring together the creative community of a city for listening to an inspirational talk and to have also to get a chance to network and, and to have a nice breakfast. So there are currently 172 cities all over the world which organize this event every month. Every month there is a topic, a theme, which is uh, set by the headquarters for this month. So this is survival, and you will see next month is uh, equality, August is genius, and I forgot what are the upcoming topics coming up. But every month so we find um, uh, a speaker who somehow is related or can connect to this theme to share with you uh, some of their experience or some of the things they have, they have done. So that's the concept of, of Creative Mornings and again every month and uh, again it's possible because we get the, the help and support of our sponsors. So one of our sponsors is uh, Mudman Group and uh, Aubon Peng. So uh, thank you so much Aubon Peng for for your support and uh, the great uh, breakfast. So maybe we can thank them. Kapun Krap. Thank you, uh, Aubon Peng. We have also Index Creative Village. So we have some of the um, multimedia uh, teams here, technician team with us. So thank you, Index Creative Village. And we have also uh, international uh, sponsors that helps Creative Morning happening worldwide. So you may have seen their names. There is MailChimp. There is Wix and there is also Shutterstock that helps Creative Morning worldwide to operate. So thanks to them also. So uh, without further ado, so I will uh, now let um, Robert uh, talk to you and share with you his experience related, related to survival. I don't know Robert very well, but it was highly recommended to me by uh, one of our colleagues um, that left Rice, uh, who could not be here today, is traveling. And he said, well, you definitely have to bring Robert on board for this topic. He is a, he is a man. So thank you, Robert, for accepting to be here today. And so the floor is yours. Thank you. Right. Good morning. I um, should introduce myself. I'm, I'm a South African. And uh, I don't know how much you know about South Africa, but we were in a war for 30 years. And I grew up as a child. Um, going through all the traumas that, that happen in a, in a civil war. So the survival, but there, there are two aspects to survival that I, I want to share with you initially. So that the first is what we used to term instant survival. You know, that's when you, uh, for example, the, when I grew up in the Limpopo River Valley for the first seven years of my life. And You've probably never heard of the Limpopo, but that's the river that divides South Africa with what was then southern Rhodesia and is now Zimbabwe. And there were an awful lot of things that would willingly eat a five-year-old. And uh, on the one occasion, I was walking with my father through a reed bed, and we could hear a hippopotamus a little further down, closer to the river. And my dad stopped and said, we, we need to really make sure where this, this hippo is. And the next moment, it actually appeared about 50 meters away. And uh, I don't know, but the, the number one creature that kills more human beings than any other is the hippopotamus. So we turned around and hightailed it back down the path, did a, a right angle turn and climbed up a tree, and the hippo came charging past a couple of seconds later. And that was my first experience of instant survival, because hippos do make very short work of a human being. The other kind of survival is the long-term grind of being able to just survive. And if any of you have been to Africa, you would see that long-term grind of trying to survive. And um, 
So that's the one I'm going to focus on today because that's the one that requires creative intelligence. That's the one where you, you can see human beings uh, coming out with the most amazingly creative ideas just to survive. And uh, so that's, that's what the talk will be about. Um, and r relating this to, to wealth creation, um, it is amazing how people, how human beings, and I've, I've traveled throughout uh, Africa and Asia now, and it always amazes me how people are able to use uh, the little that they have. And I had started working for an organization that was the biggest cement producer in the world. In, that, in those days, they were called Holder Bank, and then later Wholesome. And I was working in the African areas um, what were called townships, because of apartheid, everybody was separated. So all the blacks had that area, and the coloreds, and the Asians, and the whites were all separate. And I was working in the black areas, which introduced me to the most amazing creativity, and and how people could optimize. And part of the one of the teams we were working with was what was called the Free Market Foundation. And their slogan was, use what you've got to get what you want. So don't always have ambitions about, you know, if I had that and then I could do this. Use what you've got to get what you want. And that, I learned from that by working with these people. And our job was not to bring them into the formal sector, because why would an African want to be participating in a, in a sector that disadvantaged him? But our objective was to help develop them to make them more prosperous and to feed back into the, their social environment the, the benefits that they had gained. So, and uh, the, next, the next photograph is, is, uh, is me on a Monday morning. That's, that's me, not at my best. And, uh, them. However, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the intelligent, or the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change, and that comes from Charles Darwin. And that is really something that I've, I've realized, is that often you have people that have no education, have no experience in the field, and they come up with the most amazing ideas. And um, this is definitely counterintelligent. People go, oh, but you know, how can people participate uh, in these activities without the background information? Well, they pick it up pretty smartly. And a lot of people in Africa and in Asia are denied an education not because they're, they're dumb and can't participate, but purely for financial reasons. So. So modern human beings are able to adapt, um, and we, we can see that in, in so many of the things that we see around us. And we've learned to survive, and part of that is what you see globally is this urbanization, people leaving the, the rural areas and coming into the cities to be able to survive. I mean, you take... South Africa, for example, in 1990, there were slightly more than 60,000 farms producing and exporting products. Today, there are less than 6,000. The reason for that is the farmers being mostly Dutch and the, the government was uh, predominantly Dutch, the apartheid government. So they have been targeted, uh, and most of them have left and gone to Nigeria, Zambia, Mozambique, and other places, so that, that for them to survive, they, they have moved out of an inhospitable environment. But you can see, we've got Eskimos, we've got people living in deserts, and they are able to survive uh, due to the most amazing creativity that every human being has. So, the same success can be, that we experience physically, can also be seen economically. So, 
the next slide here, the ability to adapt from rural to urban conditions successfully. And this is where I was working in Cape Town, in, in a, a slum area or, or a squatter camp, as it was called. Uh, and I used to drive in, go to the cement factory there, but part of our corporate social responsibility was to work with the people in the environment. And um, one evening I was driving back home and I spotted this lady sitting on the side of the road with tubs of margarine. And, and I wondered what she was doing. So I stopped, walked back, and found that she was, you know, you, you buy a brick of margarine and it's in a sort of tin foil wrapper. And she was scraping the, the, rem the remnants of the margarine out of the wrappers and putting it into the tubs. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, e, <laughs> you know, hygiene, bacteria. But in those conditions, it's amazing. I mean, I've seen people in India and Sri Lanka standing in rivers, brushing, dipping their, br their toothbrush in the river and cleaning their teeth. And I've often thought to myself, that would kill me. But <laughs> they survive. You know, their the, the immune system handles that. So, and I stopped and asked the lady, like, what are you doing? And she said, oh, you know, I, I resell these things. And <clears throat> there was a whole culture that, that orientated around the garbage dump, which was not very far away. And this was her particular niche. And then I asked to her, well, who are your, who do you sell these to? And she said, oh, the restaurants. And then she pointed further down the road, and there was a couple of tables uh, with people sitting and eating there. Uh, I didn't have time to go back down there, but the next day I came in the morning and met the guy who was running the small restaurant. And a few months later, I made a movie of this guy, and he, you know, we, he was... Uh, running what it was later called the bus stop restaurants. And he, his story was, he started, he came down from the trans car and he literally had the shirt on his back and the shoes on his feet and the pants on it. And that was all he owned. He didn't have a cent to his name. And he went to his brother who was working on a building site and he said to him, how do I survive? And he said, you go to that factory over there and they chuck out the rejects, any tin uh, any tinned food that's dented or damaged in any way, you, they will chuck it out and you can pick up that stuff and either sell it or, or eat it yourself. And that's where he started. Um, one of the days he picked up a wheelbarrow and put a piece of cardboard on the bottom because it had a hole in it and he was able to move more product and gradually he developed uh, the bus stop restaurants. And these started with him literally standing there with a can opener and opening a can and giving it to people as they came out of the bus and they would give him 10 or 20 cents for the tin. <clears throat> but his creative intelligence, he then discovered that if he put down a bench <clears throat> and he created what was called in Nkosa a, a gogok, which is a paraffin tin put into another paraffin tin and you put water in the top one and you write, light a fire in the bottom one, you can heat tins of food. And he had paper plates, benches, and eventually a roof. And then at every bus stop in the Kailicha area, he had a restaurant, in inverted commas. And he became a millionaire. And I eventually made a film so of four millionaires. And they were all people that had absolutely no education. None of them could sign a check. They had no education, uh, but they had a lot of creative intelligence. And they used what they had to get what they want. And so their, their ability to survive was, was really based on their, their ability to see what was available and to, to create the, the, um, the opportunities. So we can jump forward a little bit that today in, in, an, in the outskirts of Johannesburg, you've got 40,000 ex-government employees living in these slum areas as well. And uh, the tables have been reversed because you used to have 
white racism, you've now got black racism. And uh, so the whites are on the, on the butt end of the deal. And these guys are doing exactly the same things. So you can see cross-culturally, when, when you find yourself in what is called reduced circumstances, uh, your creative intelligence kicks in. And this is the long-term grind of survival. You know, these people have had their pensions taken away or dramatically reduced from, say, 14,000 rand a month to 800 rand a month. And uh, <clears throat> they are li living in these um, very reduced circumstances. And the one particular old man there, whenever it rains and washes away the, s the sand, goes and collects things like toasters and kettles and what have you and fixes them up and sells them. And he has that ability. He's, he has the education to be able to do that. So the, you can see that this, this is one kind of survival. But right, moving on, the, that was the informal sector. If we go to the formal sector, when I first went to uh, Cambodia, it was 1996, the Khmer Rouge was still active in those days not as, a, as a, a government force, but as bandits living in the forest and, uh, and they were living in the caves of the quarry of the cement factory that we were trying to rehabilitate. So our big challenge was adapting from having a literate workforce to having a completely illiterate workforce. Thanks to Pol Pot and Tal Mok and the, and the boys, they had wiped out everybody who had even the slightest hint of education. So it was the first time in my life nobody could read a manual, nobody could uh, do anything. So we had to be fairly creative in terms of developing people. For example, pre-start checks on mobile equipment, we would have in writing. So we had to create pictures of which they just ticked as a pre-start check. Uh, so everything was done in pictures. So that this was really the, the most daunting challenge to, to actually have to work with people that could not read or write. And also there again, the level of suffering uh, of extreme poverty was, was horrifying. Uh, you had people coming in from the smaller villages into the town that A, were illiterate, B, had no experience in anything, and we're literally prepared to do anything to get a, a meal once a day. So, and, and that was a real awakening again, because I always imagined Asia was, was, was much better than Africa. And in many ways it is. So the, the bottom line of this is that they had to be more creative, but so did we. And uh, we got the whole plant uh, absolutely up and running, but after a couple of months we realized that the, we couldn't compete with the imported cement, uh, and that was because it was a fairly antiquated system. And no matter how we tried to produce cement at a reasonable price, uh, we couldn't sell it because they were bringing in imported cement from far more efficient and effective cement plants outside of Cambodia and selling it. So what we eventually did is that uh, the cement plant here that belonged to the group in Thailand, we produced it under that label that it was Naga cement in, in, in Tanzania. And uh, we were able to then produce the cement, import it and sell it much cheaper than any other import. So. Unfortunately, we had to close down that plant. And in right at the moment, now they're rebuilding a new plant in Cambodia. So it's sort of 20 years later. So, but this was another kind of creative intelligence that we then had to confront uh, that we'd never confronted before. Because you take literacy for granted. You assume that everybody can read and write. Um, Amazingly, though, I just saw a statistic on America that 28% of Americans can't read a newspaper. That's close to 100 million people. That I didn't know. 28% um, are functionally illiterate. Um, 
So, then the next step was Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka was an interesting one because uh, the, it, first of all, it was the war with the Tamil Tigers. It was 1997. And the cement factory was in the, just outside the war zone, but the quarry was in the war zone. And uh, that we, the, the key thing is that it was a state-owned organization and uh, it, it employed far more people than were necessary. And as a result, they could not compete against the imported cement from Indonesia. Imported cement was, landed cost was at $28 and the, uh, the cement factory, Pudalam Cement, uh, was producing it at $63. So <laughs> you can imagine they couldn't even begin to compete. Um, and so our job was to bring them into the, into, into sort of global competition. And um, so the streamlining it and, and really uh, getting it up, there were some major challenges. In fact, the first board meeting that I attended, um, I was told that the quarry manager had, had needed to fire two people and uh, he had been taken into the quarry and shot and killed. And that was the reason because that jobs were so critical to the survival of people. And if you want to see very thin people, go to, well, I don't know if it's still true, but there were an awful lot of very thin people in, in Sri Lanka that you would see on the roads begging. So we had to reduce the numbers from 2,700 to 2,000. And when we said that at the board meeting, there was this stunned silence for a long time. And then the chairman said, uh, you're going to get killed. <laughs> that was his only comment. He said, you are going to get killed. And then we said, no, 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 chirpy, happy. We're not going to do We won't be killed because we are going to create jobs. And that's exactly what we did. We, um, by, we started off, the first one was the, we asked if there were any Tamils, and we knew there were, that were living in the war zone that would like to start their own business. And we got, I think, 10 applicants. And we said to them, right, what we're going to do is get Hatton National Bank to finance you guys, and we'll get the Sri Lankan Small Business Development Center, SLBDC, and they're going to train you how to run your own business, and we're going to give you, at uh, no transport cost and half a percent less than anybody can get cement anywhere in Sri Lanka. And the, I think we got finally eight of the people qualified to go and run their, 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 their own business. And this then, after three months, uh, one of the uh, Tamils came back driving a 4x4. Four four. And that was very unusual because only expatriates ever drove a 4x4. Four four. And everybody was like, whoa, where does this guy get the money from? And he told everybody, I'm, I'm running my own business. I'm making huge amounts of money. And then suddenly we had a rush because everybody now wanted to start their own business. And we were going, whoa, 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 slowly. And then we had to systematically go through it. And it took us two years to reduce from 2,700 to 2,000, creating 187 small businesses, all of which supplied directly or indirectly to the cement factory, all of which every employee earned more money than they had when they worked in the cement factory. So we then realized that there were five stakeholders. And those five stakeholders were employees, Customers, shareholders, suppliers, society and environment. And all five are important. All five stakeholders are important in the, in the game of developing a successful business. And um, so there are the, the stakeholders. And we made use of what we called human capital. Now, just to go back a little bit, we originally 
we identified that there were three levels of people management in any organization. There's personnel, and if you go back to the 50s and 60s, the average personnel department were the accountants. And the profile of an accountant is a detailed-oriented person, systems-driven, top-down, controlling. So, and when the shift came in the early 60s from accounting departments running the personnel to a separate personnel department, the profile of the personnel person was pretty much the same because they're administrative. It's an administrative function. And then in the sort of 70s, there came, or 70s and early 80s, they became the HR department. And we were working with the HR department, but we realized that there was far more important the work that we were doing in, in the informal sector in Cape Town, uh, in, the, in the different sectors in Tanzania, in Kenya, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, that you needed to, to not be inward looking as you were, as personnel certainly was and HR certainly was, you needed to be outward looking, you needed to be strategic, you needed to be long term in terms of developing people. And so that's what we, um, we realized that it was critical in, in strengthening the company brand. Now that I'm, I'm sure you know what the difference between a company brand and the brand. The brand is the product or service. The company brand is the aura that surrounds the company. If you have a strong company brand, you attract and retain talent. And to be able to attract talent in the, in the Sri Lankan example is that people looked at, at uh, Putalam Cement as a, as a you know, grossly overweight organization that most people uh, didn't really have a job. I remember the first morning I walked around Putalam, uh, I'd gone to the canteen, I'd walked through all the kilns and grinding plant and what have you, and I went to, the, to check out the uh, uh, change rooms and I couldn't open the door. And finally when I managed to push it open and get my head around, I saw that it was just full of people sleeping because most of them earned such a small salary they had to work at night. And so they would come to work, clock in and go to sleep so that they could get enough rest before the next night. And, and, that, and everybody knew that, everybody accepted it. There was a small team of people actually running the plant, the rest were sleeping. And uh, so when, when you start to see these things then you understand that zero unemployment isn't something that you actually you have to believe, because those people were unemployed, really, ostensibly. They were receiving a salary, but not actually doing any work. And the, in South Africa, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the statistics, but any guess as to where, how, how many people are unemployed? I mean, Australia and, other, and America get nervous when it's like 6% or 7%. Any idea what the unemployment in South Africa is? Horrendous, yes. It's, if you believe the government, it's 38%. If you believe the private sector, it's around about 49%. Uh, that's almost half the working population. But there again, how do you define unemployed? Would you consider the lady who's selling margarine unemployed? She doesn't pay tax. She, she's not part of the formal sector. You know, is she unemployed? Well, probably not. But the, the crime rate, and is is a crime a, a formal profession? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's debatable. But certainly they're very skilled at it. Uh, crime rate is astronomical, and if you looked at some of the statistics that Time magazine produced about five or six years ago, um, it's horrifying. And in, in fact, 2014, more people died violently in South Africa than in the combined wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so that gives you an understanding of, and I, I won't go into all the other statistics, they, they're too depressing. So, strategies for survival and wealth creation. So how did this relate to human capital? 
What, what were the lessons learned and what was the journey of discovery through all of this? And the first is the selection process. Now all of you know about recruitment. Recruitment is you recruit against education, experience, um, salary is part of that criteria. But do you know how successful recruitment is? And first of all, how do you measure six successful recruitment? Uh, if you measure it on what's called fit, fit is does the person meet the criteria in the first month? And these can be targets or KPIs. If they meet 50% of KPIs in the first month, boy, they're doing well. And by the third month, they're meeting 80% of KPIs or targets. They're doing extremely well, and most people pass probation on the strength of that. Um, and so, what do you think is the, the average number that people manage to uh, make it through, not only the probation period, but actually drive success in the organization? It's round about 38%. And that's not just here in Thailand, it's a global figure. So 38% is worse than flipping a coin, because you'd be 50% right. You know, it's either heads or tails, and statistics, non-parametric statistics tells you you will be 50% right if you continue to do that. So how do you improve those odds? Well, you have to look at more than just education and experience. Why experience? Because experience is culturally related. Okay, it's culturally related. And the number one reason why people leave an organization is not because of incompetence, it's because the personality does not fit culture. And it's like, I don't, I don't get on with these guys. You know, they're strange. You know, they've got such unusual habits. And, and they don't think like I do. So then after a while, the guy quietly moves out. So, and also I've seen here a particular bank that I helped recruit from a government Thai bank to an international bank, and the guy was a high flyer in the government bank. Everybody said, wow, this guy's great. And he went and he lasted exactly one month in the international bank. The reason? The culture is so different. It's not to say one's wrong and the other's right, but they're just different. And that in this organization, his father was on the board and he played golf with the right people and he'd been to the right university. And so he had great potential in this organization. In this organization, he unfortunately, everything was performance-based. It was a performance-based culture. And he was just not up to scratch on that one. Um, so experience per se, and then also people say five years experience. Well, why not four? Why not six? Why not three? And the, the essential criterion is the impact that the person has in that organization and the similarity of the cultures. So in recruiting, we include, we have the word selection because it means recruitment and promotion. And promotion is by far the most cost-effective and efficient way of developing people. You know the person, so it's always better to go first for promotion. Then you go for recruitment. If you can find somebody in the organization, and the managing director that I worked with um, said to me, um, is there anybody to replace you tomorrow? And I said, no. And he said, well, then you better find somebody because you're not getting that promotion until you have somebody to replace you. And then he brought that out as a rule. And suddenly everybody was focusing on trying to develop people underneath them, which is completely counter-logistical. I mean, logical. The, most people believe I'm not going to develop that smart young guy because he's going to take my job. That's exactly what you should be doing. Because when he can take your job, you're in a position to move. And out of the, the five things that most managers have to do, plan, organize, lead, control, and advance or develop, the last one is the most important. Um, and that became a criteria. How many people have you developed in the last six months? 
So development was the next thing and directly related to the um, selection process. And that became learning and development. And that same MD back in uh, the late 80s said to me, we spent eight million on training this year. What was my return on investment? Uh, I looked at him and went, uh, Alan, we've, we've run uh, about 5,300 courses and we put about 8,000 people <coughs> through various training programs. And he went, literally looked at the ceiling and he said, what was my return on investment? And I thought, okay, wrong answer. Um, well, it is tax deductible. And I saw him take a deep breath and like, idiot, you know, like, what was, what was the in improvement in performance and behavior that resulted from the eight million that we invested in this process? And I went, mm, don't know, Alan. And he went, well, you better get your ass out there and find out, otherwise you're gonna pay me back the eight million. I went, no, 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 you can't do that, that's unfair. You have to tell me before. He said, well, I'm telling you now. And we came back and we said, well, we don't know. And he said, well, then what the hell are we doing this for? Why are you wasting this money on people that there's no improvement in performance? That's why we do training, isn't it? And I went, yeah, that's right. And that's when we started, and he termed the term return on learning invested. And that was one of the KPIs that we had in here. Now, interesting, if you look at uh, most recruitment budgets and you look at training budgets, when you go back to your organization, ask, how much money does my organization spend on recruitment and how much do they spend on training? Yeah. I guarantee they spend more money on training than they do on recruitment. The reason being, it's tax deductible. Okay? But it's counterproductive. If you get that right, sorry, If, press the wrong button. If you get that right, you will spend much less money on that. Now, how do you do that? We have a thing called an ideal candidate profile, where we have the can-do factors, education, experience, training, important experience, useful experience, language, and those are all can-do factors. The can-do factors tells you that the person can do the job. You don't want a doctor who's never been to medical school. You don't want an engineer that doesn't have an engineering degree. However, there are an awful lot of things more than that. I mean, I've, I have friends who are qualified doctors, medical doctors, and they have a hopeless bedside manner. I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, you've got cancer and you're going to live for about three months. Any questions? Okay. They, they really aren't very good in the healing process. Very knowledgeable, wonderful, but, and, and academically very bright. And the selection process does exactly that. It, it selects them to be just very bright people. But there's, a, there's more to being a really good doctor in the healing process, and certainly preventative medicine as well, which is another criteria. But get the selection right, and this becomes much easier. And so we look for strengths. We identify strengths in the very early days, and we have a, a, uh, a system called the bridging profile so that people hit the ground running. On their first day, they write out their own action plan. And that also creates, so what they do is that you ask them questions. So where, what are the things that you do that you've learned very fast, you perform at an above average level and you love doing it. That's your strengths. Tell us about your strengths. What are your skills? And then they go and meet their boss, their peers and their subordinates and they say, what keeps you up at night? Not the neighbor's dog, but what are the things in your head that keeps you awake at night? And the guy goes, well, A, B and C. And he goes, which do you think I could help you with? Well, maybe C. Great, explain it to me. And then the guy writes it down, he comes back, maybe an hour or so later, and says, look, this is what I think I can do. Guy says, great, go for it. At the end of that day, he writes out his own action plan, which includes all of those things, and the, what it creates in people's minds is, hey, this guy really knows his stuff. He's a great member of the team. So it has very positive spin-offs, 
And as the slogan says, they hit the ground running. So then getting that right, you move to this. And learning and development is the biggest waste of time, and I was totally accountable for this. I, I wasted people's time for hours and hours and hours, uh, sitting in a classroom for eight hours, having a pre-test, a post-test, and then they'd walk out and they'd do absolutely nothing. No improvement in performance and behavior. So now the trend of what we encourage is for people to uh, focus on a gap. And the gap is that you've got all the criteria that the person has to do, their job profile aligns all of that, and that how what they do is when they are failing to achieve a target or a KPI, you don't automatically assume that a training program is necessary. What you do is that you say to people, right, what, what is it that's going on in your job? And then there are what we call the seven questions. Do you have the right tools? Has it been explained carefully enough what you have to do? Do you get the right that if you want your organization to ramp up, then you need to start seeing your uh, human beings that work with you not as a resource that you want to minimize because a resource is a cost. You want to actually see them as an asset, a human asset that you want to invest in and optimize. And, and that is a completely different frame of reference. Uh, and makes a dramatic difference in, in the way that you deal with people. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions?
Thank you, Robert. So uh, we have 15 minutes for questions. So anyone has a question to start with? Don't be shy. Yes, Ali. Thank you very much for the enlightening talk. Uh, very helpful indeed. Uh, I want to know about the fact that you talked about, talk about this selection procedure and the development and motivation. And uh, the fact that you know, the selection procedure is not paramount important. Because we're going to uh, basically select the most talented, most intelligent, most productive individual. But in my, my personal case, there's more and more dealing with not, not, not the private sector, mostly with government or state universities and stuff. The story is the, the other way around. Most of the time, we say that the survival and success of the organization depends on meritocracy, that the most qualified people are going to be selected. But bitterly ironically, my personal experience has shown me that the least qualified, least talented, least productive, are selected from the from from the from the scratch. Because like, like I applied for universities before, like other countries. Then like with enormous publications, enormous books and, and memberships and qualifications. And the, the other the guy who was selected basically had no qualification whatsoever. Because the, 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 the manager or the head of the department or the dean, they find you know the qualified people as a threat. And they find them intimidating, and they find them in a sort of a threat and a menace to their managerial policies. So I think, contrary to what Darwin said as the say, survival of the, the fittest, we have the survival of the least qualified. And in this also is shown in the political system that the, the least qualified, the least intelligent people have got the power and the dominance. So how, how, do you, how do you resolve this uh, irony, basically? That the life, life is not like that. The, what, what we see is the irony of, you know... Yeah, yeah um, very good question. It's, it's something that you find not just in government organizations, NGOs, you find it all over. And it's... it's it's moving away from a seniority system to a performance-based system. You know, one of the things that is, is certainly that we experience is that a lot of these organizations are sheltered employment. That, you know, you take a government, we, we see organizations in, in six different levels. And, and that's the level of competitiveness, uh, the, 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 which leads to the number of change of products and, and the spread of competitive field. So government organizations are level one. They have no competition. They, you know, if you want to get a driver's license, you go there and it can be as rude as they like. Uh, and if you have to tolerate that, because if you want a driver's license, you've got to put up with it. And uh, I, I remember going here once and they kept sending me downstairs to get photocopies. And they said, and, oh, you have to have this page to photocopy. I ran downstairs, came back up again, and they said, oh, you've got to do this page too. And after the fourth time, I said, okay, the joke's on me. Now, how many pages? Oh, all of them. Okay, good. So I short circuited many trips downstairs and upstairs again. But you have to put up with that because if you want your driver's license, you have to smile and say, kakuma ka, and just get on with it. They have no competition. You couldn't say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not putting up with this and walk off and go and get a driver's license somewhere else. So that's one of the things. Level two of cement organizations, steel industry, it's, it, they are, in many instances, regional and global, but they don't have much competition uh, because of their entry, the barrier to entry is capital. So, and then you go through uh, three, four, five, and six. Six is the mobile phone, IT industry, it's changing literally weekly and monthly, it's global, it's highly competitive, you know. Um, Sony, Nokia are examples of people who were top dog and then in a very short time dropped out of the, out of the scene and have to struggle to get back. So that's part of the problem, is that it's the level of competitiveness. And the organizations that you talk about, they don't really have in the back of their minds, a performance-based culture. Why do they need it? And, and I experienced that in the cement industry. You know, you, you've got a 
work pretty hard to to be non-competitive in the cement industry. Okay, so usually only three or four players. And contrary to popular belief, but I'm sure there's some community going on, like we'll sell in this area, if you sell in that area. So um, the, that's part of the criteria, but also, and, and therefore the need to get high performing people in place uh, is much less. So those kind of industries. But it also applies in, in other industries, uh, say level three, four, motive, automotive, hospitality. <coughs> those kind of industries are kind of in the middle there. They're competitive, the products are changing, but uh, the, the understanding of what really drives uh, the, 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 the attraction of talent. For example, putting up cement, um, when we first started, there were some, some talented people there, but when we advertised, we got a small pool of low quality people. So how do you choose talent when it doesn't exist in the pool of applicants? So then you have to build your brand. And building your brand then attracts uh, talented people to apply, and you really know your brand is strong when you've got people coming and knocking on your door and saying, here's my CV and this opportunity, please call me. And there are, on the, on the ideal candidate profile, there are high weight candidates. You can see by the high weight points that these people are talented. They've got the personality that's going to match the culture and drive performance. But to answer your question simply, uh, you can introduce those things, but at a board level, they have to decide what is the direction, and if it's going to be competitive, then you know. But your core values and your key success driving behaviors that are aligned with your core values are the critical part of that. Most companies, you go in and you say, "Why have you got core values?" And they go, "Well, you know, they guide our thinking." You go, "How exactly do you do that?" And they go, "Well, you know, we bear the values in mind while we do it. When last did you do that?" Oh, all the time, all the time, you know, I'm guided by that, which is garbage. Core values, you know, you can see the fossil fuel industry, you know, the core values are, you know, to do wonderful things, but in terms of the five stakeholders, environment and society, doesn't come on the map, okay? Or if they do something, corporate, corporate social investment, it's always splurged out. It's like we're spending money on here and we are such good guys. So corporate social involvement, corporate social investment, corporate social responsibility are three different things to, to help attract talent. And, and yes, those industries do attract talented people, certainly people who are very, very bright. But it's, it's not in line with the competitiveness of those organizations. But thank you, good question. Yeah. Uh, you can hear me without um, Speaking of the topics you're talking about, there, there are three points that, that came to my mind. First question is that um, recruitment, so or survival in terms of your topic. Question is what's in it for me? Uh, let's take one example of in business, uh, like for example, the case of Steve Jobs being brought out from the company he's actually built and create all the innovations. Or if you look at the larger scale like macro policy or politics, what's in it for me looking at the US politics right now and France and the recent elections, I don't need to spell them out, what's in it for me, how could it uh, affect uh, the survival of the the society. Second point, um, um, can we just deal with the first oh, one? Okay. Um, I, my memory is not that good. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, taking Steve Jobs, he, he's a good example of core values and key success driving behaviors that, uh, and I don't know all the ins and outs of why he was asked to leave. But certainly, he was a great driver of success, but also he created a lot of disruption in, in the organization. And uh, you know, 
the difference between a really great leader uh, that encourages people to positive motivation uh, and one that, that creates uh, an environment based on threat and fear, uh, what we used to call that KITA management, K-I-T-A, which stands for kick in the arse. <laughs> and that kind of management only works while you're sitting and watching people. But as soon as an organization gets too big, it's very difficult to manage with KITA management. So, and to, to answer the question, uh, I, I personally don't think that uh, it's, it's a sustainable kind of development that is driven by KITA management. And, you know, Steve Jobs is gone, and we, we have to wait to see in the next 20 years whether Apple is still around in 20 years. But the chances are it will be, but not in the predominant position that it's in at the moment. I might be wrong, but a very strong leader like that, normally there are not very many people underneath them that can pick up the act and, and drive it. Because well, by their nature, they're very domineering. Does that answer your question? Oh. Yes, yes. Actually, it's linked to my second point. But looking at what's in it for me in terms of larger scale like politics is going on in the world, how do we be crazy? Yeah. It's about what's in it for me, for individuals. Okay. You, you see okay. what I'm trying but, to go between Trump question. and Trump? Okay, good question. I missed that, sorry. The the what's in it for me is that most human capital organizations focus on your strengths. What are you really good at? What are the things that you learn easily, perform at an above average level, and love doing it? So it starts in the selection process. So it's identification and development of strengths, rewarding. And that is driven throughout the whole time you're there. So you, there's this continuous improvement. Uh, and that's what's in it for people. Because most organizations don't, unless you're human capital and focusing on what are your strengths, how do we apply them to your job and, and, and drive your personal development to drive the company's development. Well, I think what they need for me actually implies to actually people would act or behave based on self-interest. Let's say their motivation in one organization is for learning or for money or for you know, job, security, proximity, whatsoever. So I think actually my what's in it for me is back to the motivation. Why would we recruit that person? And why would that person want to stay in the organization? But thank you for raising, uh, explaining about the job, uh, Steve Jobs uh, <coughs> leadership style because he um, actually is coming to my second point. Because I think a lot of time, he, despite people have motivations, but people don't leave the organizations until the certain serious incident. For example, they leave, people don't leave the organization nor the job, but people leave the bad boss because they can't tolerate to be uh, being abused. True. Sure. Actually, it's not just the boss, it's the peers as well. True. Sure. No. And that's when personality does not match culture. That, that was the term that we used because. You know, sometimes this is a, it is a thing that we struggle to really understand is sometimes you have high performing teams and the manager is so-so, you know, he's no great deal, but the team makes him look good because he, he performs well. And then the reverse, sometimes a really mediocre team <coughs> performs well because of a great manager and we can never really decide which it was. It's a combination of both. Yes, and that's what I'm leading to the third point. It's actually about the structure of the organization. Every organization has its structure. And structure actually determines um, temperament and the recruitment process. Like, for example, like this example, you might hire unqualified people to work because it's how the structure is run. If you have someone who's very high performing, it's intimidating. So the organization is very static, therefore. So it depends on the structure. If you work for Google, their recruitment process is crazy. The, the exam questions are like extraordinary. I would say weird, weird questions or ex on exam. So it's about structure and what type of people they want to recruit. 
and you will see the patterns of chamber of man. Okay, that's a great point because that structure defines to a large degree function. Like we always use the analogy, if you've got steel, aluminium, poles, and dacron cloth, you can build a hang glider, or you can throw away the dacron cloth and build a bicycle. But the how you structure it is how what you're going to use it for. So how you structure your organization is uh, will define how efficient and effective the outcome is. So structure is critically important. But um, the the key thing in that is the selection process really follows the business plan. Okay? And the business plan is set up by the top people. And there are a lot of organizations like Ricardo, Sendler, Senko, you know, they highly participate in, in how they, they actually run their organization. So selection is done similarly to that, but the, the, uh, the people in, in the process of selection are usually the team to which those people kind of work with. But, but yeah, good question. Thank you. Okay, we'll take the last question. Thank you. Okay, um, my question is, the, what would be your suggestion for strategy uh, for survival for the employee who found themselves not fit to the culture of organization? Would you suggest him to go to the canteen and start looking for machinery? <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> go to the garbage dump and use your creative intelligence, but the chances are you're not going to be very creative. Because one of the things that we found, and, and it's a great question actually, because, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever gone for three or four days with no food and no opportunity of getting food in the immediate future. Have any of you ever experienced that? You've been lost, or you're in the military and they've dropped you into some strange place and you have to find your way back? You've done that. Right. And that's what we used to have to experience. They would drop us off in places and say, find your way back. And it's to test your mental. But it's only when you really have not eaten for two or three days and you haven't had very much water that the creative juices really get going. You know, when you really are back against the wall and your life does hang you. <laughs> I know, yeah, sure. I mean, everybody has uh, some uh, different needs. But it's, but to, to answer your question, you know, it depends on the situation that you're in as to how urgent that need is. You know, if, you, if you've got, you know, you've got a pension and a provident fund, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that we found is that the, the things that were highly successful in America, you know, um, Tom Peters in Search of Excellence, um, Hobie's Seven Habits, you know, they were, there were some cultural things that were very different. You know, life in America during those years that those people produced those books were very different to life in Africa. And even though there's a lot of common sense in that, in many instances it didn't apply, it just didn't work because uh, life was just so different in Africa. But to, if, if you really don't like an organization um, and you don't feel that you fit the organization, you should really understand, not, not just look at the balance sheet and, and the profit and loss of another company, but understand the culture of that company because that's where you really fit in. You fit in at a behavioral level. And if, if you are performance based and everything else, it's the behavior, it's the core values and the key success driving behaviors. We actually have a game that we get people to play and that, that game is called the SMILE program. SMILE, because smiling is the first point of contact and it's the first positive interaction that people have. And you can do that cross culture. So the SMILE program is, first of all, we don't teach you what is good quality service. Uh, secondly, that you try and catch somebody doing something right and you send them a smile mail and then every week that's reviewed and if they get a smile point and then they get to 25 smile points they get tickets to a food court or whatever. 
And the SMILE program which actually develops your key success driving behaviors that align with the core values. And it's positively focused. We don't look at behaviors that are negatively focused. Okay, I'm sorry I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. Maybe you can give us another round of applause. Thank you so much, it was very inspirational and uh, then left was right here where's the guy to talk about survival, so your experience really. So we have a little token of appreciation for Robert. Another one? Yes. Thank you so much again for coming here with us today and for sharing your, your very much. Thank you. So Robert, we still want some of you still have some questions for Robert. I'm sure you will be delighted to, to answer them. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for uh, also to all the uh, Creative Mornings volunteers for the technical team of Bangkok University again, Obompe and Index Creative Village for, for being with us. Uh, we have also, uh, Robert mentioned a lot about this uh, creative intelligence. And so we are launching also a new program here at Bangkok University, which is called the MBI, Master in Business Innovation. So we have Miss Patarin, who should be around here. Patarin, are you here? Uh, Patarin, no, okay, she's not, she, she will be back. But uh, anyway, if you, some of you are interested to learn more about this new uh, creative and innovative program, you can talk to me or you can talk to Patarin as soon as she'll be back. Thank you again. Our next Creative Morning event will be on 14th of July, which is Bastille Day, with a French uh, lady who will be here and we'll talk about uh, the topic would be uh, equality. So I really encourage you to be back, but we will inform you about this. Thank you again. Have a great day and see you very soon. Kapoor Krav. Okay.